This is Annabelle Guberti and you are listening to Lawfully Creative, my podcast to talk with professionals in the creative industries to hear their stories, what inspires their creation, what decisions change their careers, what relationships influence their work. Today's episode is brought to you by Crefovi, our London and Paris-based law firm focused on advising the creative industries. Subscribe to our podcast, Lawfully Creative, or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, YouTube, Anchor, and many more podcast aggregators and platforms. Please do leave a review and rating about our podcast to encourage others to discover our curated content. Thank you. Hello. Hello, Lucie. Hi. Can you hear me? Very well, yes. Can you hear me too? Yes, actually, I need to lower the sound. <laughs> nice to meet oh, you. Yeah. Yes, nice to meet you too. This is how we meet now. So that's yeah. the best way. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Have you been attending the um, European film market, the EFM online? virtual set. Not really. Some of my colleagues have. I, I haven't. It's a quiet one for my company this year, so um, I have so much to do anyway. But right. I've, I've heard there's a lot going on. It's pretty busy, right? Yes. Well, I have been attending since Monday. It's very difficult when you also have to basically manage your clients' files, but it is what it is. So, um, yeah, I saw your colleagues, Anna Vincente, the head of sales, Clio, Berger and uh, Luc Broly, our uh, festival manager of your company, are actually attending. So I was wondering, I didn't have a, a, a chance to look at your slate yet, but um, I'm trying to catch up. I'm, I'm, I'm actually catching up on all the, uh, the presentations for of day, t- day three of, uh, of, of EFM. So I was Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there's a lot. I heard that platform is really good. This is becoming key now for online festivals to, to have a good setup. And I've heard uh, Berlin is, is really good. Yeah, just before you came, actually, just before we started that call, I, I was, um, because you can watch some videos in replay, thank God. Um, mm-hmm. And so one of them was on virtual production. So that's quite interesting as, as well to see that now quite a lot of film sets are actually created virtually. So that's quite yeah. that's hard to know more about that. <laughs> <laughs> so are we ready to get cracking we're ready, I'm ready. Yes. yes thanks cool. for organizing this and thanks for sure. <laughs> that's how you say it yeah yeah no great you, you seem to have like you know quite a, a really a good uh, good career so far in the entertainment industry so really well done i had to look of course at your linkedin profile so uh, before we we delve we delve into this i saw that you you actually attended a uh, master's oh. master's degree in media business um Business law, sorry, what, what's, what's that? How, how is it called? C'est Master de. C'est uh, uh, D2A, Droit et Administration Audiovisuelle, in French. Why so it's, um, it's the law department of La Sorbonne, and they have like okay. a couple of uh, specific master's degrees for um, that are like targeting um, film, media, a little bit of covering a little bit of uh, advertising as well, but it's mostly about film and television. Uh, as awesome. law and business. Yeah, yeah, it's well, really good. You, you enjoyed that? Did you enjoy the, this master's degree, the courses? Yes, that was really good because it was um, half of the classes were given by actual, like by film professionals and the other half was like oh. law teachers, basically. Um, so that was really interesting, I think, for all of us because we came from different backgrounds, um, the people in the in the course. And yeah, that was a great way to... At the same time, learn what we needed to learn in terms of like um, the academics side of things, and also speaking to professionals and understanding exactly like what this business was and where we see ourselves. So, when did you complete that master's degree course in me- media and business law? Uh, twenty twelve, I think. Twenty twelve. That's when I found in Crefovi, okay. Because back then when I was uh, myself a, a student in master's degree, so that was back in 99, actually, 1999, we didn't have such funky, funky master's degrees. Mm-hmm. We didn't have that. I mean, having said that, though, I did do one which was 
uh, uh, dual language, uh, Italian law, French law. I wasn't admitted in okay. law, so yeah. So that was called the uh, magistère. Um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and but but uh, so I actually completed it in '99 in 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 Milan as well, in Milan in Italy okay. for a year. But um, I don't think in my time uh, we had we had like sort of great master's degree which were so specialized for the entertainment industry so that's really good to know and so is that how you um set a foot into the um, entertainment industry for your first job at tf1 uh, i think it was the first job um, you landed right yes uh tf1 it was an uh, internship it was not a job uh-huh. job as in okay <laughs> well you were you doing that while you were doing the master's degree or before or after Yes, I think, you know what, I don't remember exactly the timeline, but I think I worked at TF1 uh, in between, because I had I, I did a first okay. master's degree in um, film business. Wow. Um, uh, before joining La Sorbonne for this uh, MBA. It's kind of, the, I think they would call it an MBA over here. So you have two, two, two master's degrees. Master's degrees that I, in, that, uh, yes. Okay. One is okay. more business oriented and also it was at uh, Paris 3, which is a university that's more focused on um, your essays and your research. It's not, it's not very, uh, it's very academic. It's not very practical. While um, okay. the one I did after at La Sorbonne Paris uh, in law involved, as I said, a lot of uh, professionals also yeah. uh, training. Pa- uh, and Paris 3 is Assas? Paris 3 is La Sorbonne Nouvelle. La Sorbonne Nouvelle. So it's called okay. La Sorbonne as well. Okay. <laughs> okay, so basically you did that uh, internship at TF1, which was unremunerated, uh, between the two uh, master's <laughs> degrees. Yes, and then uh, after the second master's degree, I had to in- I had to do an internship as well to, to complete the course. And I went to the sales uh, company Memento Film International, mm-hmm. um, which was at that time they had just they had it was I think their their fifth year they had been created five years ago so it was still quite a young company right. but they had just won uh, the Oscar for the best foreign film with um, Asraf Faradi the Iranian director for a Separation I think it was oh yes too, but yeah, I, I, was, I, I wish that film that was good. So, that was a turning point for the company. So that was just, um, it was a bit of a coincidence, but being in a sales company at that point where they were kind of taking this turn of being like an independent company doing mostly foreign language to having this international exposure through this uh, Oscar winning director, that was very interesting. For sure, for sure. So that was your first job that you landed after the master's degrees. Yeah, for... that was my training at the end of uh, oh, my master's training. Master. Okay. And so, I mean, is your family or your parents, are they oriented in, in, in the, I mean, do they work? Do they have careers in the entertainment sector? I mean, how did this come about? Because apparently from a quite a young age, you, you were, you know, focusing on already on advising the, um, the film and, um, and uh, audiovisual sector. So how, how did this come about, this passion for, for this type of uh, creative content? Whenever. My parents do not work in the industry at all. It's totally different what they do. Um, what do they do? I think I'd, uh, my mom is a doctor and my dad used to work in um, like professional trainings, but like in for engineers and like nothing to do with the uh, nothing to do with entertainment. Okay. Uh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I just I wanted to as. Uh, Many young people, I guess, want to, you dream of working in something creative, you don't want to have an office job, um, you want to, you don't know, maybe if you're a bit arts oriented, you, you want to work with something that has to do with creativity and arts and artists and talents. And I knew I wanted to to work with films because that was the most mainstream uh, medium uh, in my eyes, at, at least. Like I love theater as well. I love contemporary arts and music. But it did feel like theater was something that, uh, not theater, films actually, it was something that everybody could um, relate to in a way, you know, and, and I, I knew I wanted to work in an industry that was um, relatable in a sense. Yeah, and widely distributed as well, because at the end of the day, mm-hmm. you need a exactly. tablet or even a phone to be able to watch content, film content. Well, if you are, if you're going to the theater, you know, you, it's a bit different, you have to go to a place. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, 
it's interesting you're saying that a lot of young people work to uh, want to work in creative endeavors because again I, I, I sort of uh, compare myself at, at your age you know when we was just straight out of university and um, and frankly I was quite a, attracted in working in a bank <laughs> was happy to work in investment banking you know, in the 80s you know we were all well, maybe that's a generation thing Exactly, we were generation Y, all the UPs, you know. So I was happy to actually work as a, mm -hmm. in investment banking for for like ten years before founding Crefovi. Um Okay, well, no, but that's great. I'm I'm glad to hear that you know the generation after were probably born in the eighties and is is more. I mean, I guess with the with the two thousand and eight crisis, bankers just got a bit of a bad rap. <laughs> and <laughs> a bad rep and also there were less opportunities you know there were less opportunities that's true that's also when I had some sort of career change and start to think about something else more more fulfilling creatively as you were just saying yeah oh yes I see what you mean so that these opportunities were no longer there for your generation in any case or it was just it didn't have maybe like uh, such a good image no. as it may have a few years before because just because of the crisis it was I guess in the uh, like um common psyche it was like yeah. oh bank messed up you know right so, right right well which which was very true yeah. 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 it's very true I, I remember that when i worked at buckley's capital in particular i was seeing you know some transactions coming my way and i had to actually you know say yeah let's go for it let's do this and i was like i don't feel very comfortable saying yes, yes to this from a legal standpoint you know but they just force you they just force you to, to say yeah fuck off and just say yes you legal <laughs> Oh my God! That's another so much pressure. <laughs> well, pressure. All these guys actually—they um, were actually banned banned by the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, ten years later. You know, the likes of Bob Diamond, etc. They got expelled because what they did was just really crazy at Barclays Capital. And I knew it by ve back, back then. You know, I knew already that they were fucking about. But you know, uh, um, it's it's yeah, difficult to, it to make a stand when you are just in house legal with two, three or four years experience. But I, 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 my, my nose was already telling me that we were thinking about. Um, okay, so then you went to the West End film. So how did this transition happen between you? Be, I mean, when you when you were at Momento, was that that was probably already in London, right, or were they in Paris? Momento. Uh, they're in Paris. They're Paris based. Um, yeah, I, that just happened by chance, just like a lot of things. I had a okay. friend working at West End Films and um, she called me one day. I was um, just about to book tickets to go traveling to Brazil. And my friend calls me on a Wednesday morning and she's like, we need an in-house legal. When, like, can you come to London and have an interview? And had an interview a week after and moved to London 10 days after. And that was it. You didn't, it's it, been you didn't make it to Brazil, did you? Uh, I made it to Brazil four years after. <laughs> it, just, it, it was delayed a little bit, you know. <laughs> so what, just what, a does, small dip. <laughs> what does Western film? So when did you move to London through Western End film? What, which year was that? Twenty thirteen, March twenty thirteen. Thirteen, so like uh, uh, seven eight years ago. So um, then, then what, what? What? What do they? What did they? Or do what do they specialize in? Western films. So it's a sales agency as well for films. So sales, film sales, sometimes people are not very um, familiar with. Um, it's like exportation, but for films, right? So in, it's basically we are the middleman between the producer and the local distributor. Okay. Uh, it's business to business. Uh, we attend markets and we, we market the films, as in we present them to distributors with uh, marketing materials, sales posters, sales sheets. So you are a sales agent. Yes, You're exactly. Working on behalf of the producers. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And is that still something that you are doing right now at um, with your team, of course, at at Dog Wolf, or, or were you talking specifically about the West End Films job description here just now? That's also what I do at Dog Wolf, but Dog Wolf is a more um, vertically integrated company. Dog Wolf does only documentary films, but yeah. uh, Dog Wolf also. Uh, is involved in finance and production and UK distribution. So um, while when I was at West End, we, we at the time at least the company was doing strictly was being strictly a sales agent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what so did you attend some of the um, the festivals and sales markets that you just mentioned um, uh, uh, while yeah. being there at West End? These, these are actually keys for our business. So uh, obviously, um, depending on which films you are selling. 
some markets are going to be more important than others mm-hmm. um can remains yeah really the right. very yeah yeah the one for at least i think at least for films that are uh, aiming at having a prestigious festival life so winning uh, awards being in Cannes or anywhere else or mm-hmm. obviously like what we call the A-list festival circuits um, there is a couple of festivals in North America that are very important so Toronto and, and Sundance oh, um, really? Berlin obviously you used to go to Sundance as well yeah As- Sundance is Sundance is a key festival if you are selling rights in the US as well wow um, Really? Yeah. Is it more, yeah. more important than the American film market, which is in November every year in Santa Monica? I'm kind of the post uh, AFM generation, I think. It's been uh, since eight years that I, nine years now that I work in the film business, every year everyone is saying, oh, maybe it's the last AFM, maybe it's the last AFM. Ooh. It's been less and less um, important. Maybe it was, maybe I'm. I'm, I might be exaggerating a bit. Maybe it was still four or five years ago. Okay. Uh, but the AFM was mostly a financing market, like a, yeah. a market made to pre-sell film rights to finance the films. And this is happening, as you know, it's happening less and less. Mm-hmm. Um, distributors don't have the cash flow for this. They don't really have to do this because they can just wait for the films to be ready and, and see the final product. So AFM is also, it's not a festival. So there's no There's no red carpet. But I didn't know that Sundance was the market. I didn't know that Sundance was the market. I thought it was mostly only a festival, Sundance. It's quite like, I mean, it's it's a festival. It's not the marketplace per se. As it, There's nothing like the Marché du Film, for instance. No. But like, you've been like huge uh, deals coming out of Sundance in the last like four or five years. And this is the market that uh, the global players have kind of targeted to make their big splashes. Um, I think when Amazon bought... Um, Birth of a Nation, which was maybe five years ago, which was their first big buy when everyone was like, okay, Amazon Studio is now um, on the field and is going to be the first competitor to Netflix. That was at Sundance. Which which title was that again? Da 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 of a Nation? Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation, yeah. yeah I, I think it was at Sundance. I would need to check, but I'm pretty sure it was a Sundance title. How interesting. So what about Telluride? Is that on the agenda or not at all? Strong. It is... It is. It's not on the key agenda, no. but it's it's on the agenda because the programmers are really good. It's always it's always going to be quality films, like quality titles. The thing with Telluride is like it's strictly a festival. It's not a marketplace, and they have this thing where they announce uh, like very shortly before the beginning of the festival. That's mm-hmm. their thing. So you can't really like like gear up for Telluride because mm-hmm. until a few days before Telluride, you don't know what's in Telluride. <laughs> So it's a bit hard to position yourself and because it's like, it's also not very easy to attend. It's in the middle of the summer. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think like September. Right, right. Okay, so starting with, uh, so starting the uh, annual year with um, uh, in Utah, with Sundance, as you were saying, in the late city, yeah. Park city, I can't remember. Then moving on to Cannes, what about Berlin? Surely the EFM must be on the calendar. In, in, in yes, no? it is. It's on calendar for European buyers. Oh, okay. um, then, in terms of the festival selection, it's quite. It's very uh, author-driven, mm-hmm. foreign language. So it really depends what's your market. For some companies, this is uh, their bread and butter. But for some other companies, it's just uh, if if you focus on like uh, English language films with A-list cast, Berlin is not gonna be like uh, your key event of the year. Right. And um, then I suppose Cannes, um, did you go to Cannes with Western Films and Dog Wolf or? Yes, yes. Uh, I mean Cannes obviously is like uh, the major festival um, if you're doing independent films, like independent in like the broad sense of independent, so anything that's not a studio production I would call independent. Did you, did uh, you watch the series uh, 10%? I call my agent. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> the scenes in Cannes were quite funny. Uh, although to be far, uh, to be to be to be honest, so rocambolesque. I mean, the stories are like out of this world. This this yeah. Amy played by uh, uh, Margot Margot Mota, I think. Uh, 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 you know, the, 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 the main agent. Uh, Camille, Camille Cotin, yes. Mm. Camille Cotin, sorry. I mean, she's just so wild. <laughs> yeah. um, 
But it's not, it's not totally, I actually, um, uh, my family watched it in, in France and I like to tell them, like, this is a little bit close to what I do, except that we're not as close to, to talents and stars, but right. you get a little more what my business is about. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really good. I, I love, yeah. I love the, the episode in Cannes, actually, with, um, yeah. uh, what's her name? Uh, 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 yes. You know, but uh, uh, I think it's, she's got a problem with her dress because she she just falls from the and then she's got this guy who is following her him her around because she's wearing like a, a ten million euros necklace or something from Chopin. <laughs> uh, all right, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's it's uh, it's brilliantly written this series. Yes, for for sure. Um, so what is the, how, how would you describe your day to day activity at Dog Wolf? which, as you said, is more vertically integrated through production, uh, world sales, and, um, and UK distribution. Uh, um, yeah, ha, ha, as, a, as a business affair and legal affairs manager. Mm. Um, it's a lot of contracts. <laughs> <laughs> good, very good. It's a lot of... Uh, it's a lot of drafting and re reviewing and uh, negotiating licenses, um, mm -hmm. mostly licenses and everything that goes with it. So the offers, um, all finance related agreements. So of course, if you, if you're co-financing the film, you're going to have to do the collection account management agreement. You're going to have to work maybe on loan agreements. If you have a lender, maybe completion guarantees. Um, yeah, everything that goes with the financing of the film. And of course, there's the other side of the, the other legal side, which is um, anything that's copyright related and, and chain of titles. So talents agreements, producers agreements, um, release forms, music licenses, all of this. Do you also deal with... So it's a lot of, it's a lot of uh, paperwork. <laughs> and it's, it's a lot of coordination with the team as well, because as I said, sales agents with a middleman so um you need to be on top of what's going on oh i lost you there hello okay. yes yes we can that was a bit yeah. of a it's fine now i lost you when you were saying it's a lot of contracts etc etc i just wanted to know do you also deal with the insurance side of things since since you are also doing production a little bit i mean we work with the main producer producers for production insurance and um, errors and omissions insurances. But that's not a big part of what we do. Okay. We just need to make sure all our films are covered. Well, okay. But on this point of insurance, apparently at the moment with COVID, it's getting more and more difficult for productions to get insurance. Is that something you confirm? Yes, yes. I've heard it from uh, many other people that it's harder to get an insurance, it's harder to get a loan, it's harder to get completion guarantee, it's harder to get a bond, like everything, every, all your backups basically are harder to secure. So it's, it's a really good uh, time to be making animation. So that's the big joke going around. Like every, we should all be doing animation because it's just like people in, in a room and you can be two meters apart and you don't need to go outside or don't even need to wear a mask. Mm. It's just you and your computer. And for us, as far as documentary goes, it's a, it's a good time to make uh, documentaries based on stock footage or mm. archives or uh, focus on the focus on the what's happening in the edit room basically yeah oh, yes. it's really hard to be well it's right got to adapt i guess well this is also where this virtual production thing is coming into play i mean this is going to be instead of having everyone you know staying in a green room and um and shooting like that then if you can do everything through virtual production with even like the actors actually doing the um the acting bit from their own house <laughs> So that they are COVID protected it would be amazing. Um, okay. Yeah. How would you describe one of your uh, like regular day? I mean, now, not pre-COVID, but now. How would you describe one of your regular day as the business, head of business and legal affairs at Dog Wolf? Um, what time? I mean, do you first, start? Do you, what time do you finish? Uh, it's office hours. I mean, office hours have been a little bit blurred with COVID because we're working from home, so. Uh, there is a temptation to drag a bit later in the day and get more things done with the US. That's the main thing that dictates my day. Okay. It's the time zone. So in the morning, I will focus on Asia and Europe. And in the afternoon, I will focus on the US. Right. It's a lot of emails. 
and and it's making like some some free time not free time and some some no emails time um to focus on the paperwork and the agreements and and the yeah. licenses so that's that's kind of the balance um a lot of emails with our distributors around the world our producers a lot of emails with the team as well there's there's no the distributors big... for us Do, you... sorry would you be able to name some of his distributors that you usually? Uh, yes. Sure. So you're gonna have the good thing with documentary is it, it's that it's um it's a format that is getting a lot of traction right now, and so we will be dealing at the same time with like global players like Netflix, Amazon, um, the the American broadcasters, Showtime, uh, HBO, and so on and so forth, and you also have distributors like um, more locally so of course broadcasters in europe so the arte is a dev group um all the public television channels in scandinavia for instance the documentaries okay. uh, in eastern europe as well spain as well um then you have the pay television channels like sky uh, in the uk and in germany and then you have the all rights distributors who will take our documentaries on the big screen um so I mean, there's there's many many of them, but um, you will have yes, yes, and that's what I that's what I love. Um, one of the things I love about this job is that you get to work with such a wide range of people, such a wide range of people. Yeah, and as you want to be in the same day dealing with okay. like yes. Uh, on the continent and also the size of the companies and that's very that's very interesting to be at the same time working with like in very small independent distributors maybe in in poland or in japan and also big studios in los angeles right and there's a there's a there's the buzz going around the um, efm at the moment online of course as everything is virtual that there is actually a, a content shortage that there is not enough content especially european content that is needed um, especially for these new streamers, the likes of HBO, Paramount, Disney, um, to uh, they need that European content to be able to show the you know the like the legal, the statutory ten percent, or I think it's a bit more re European content that needs to be shown on these platforms if they want to be able to. Um, to uh, basically distribute the uh, streaming services in Europe. Would you agree that there is indeed a shortage of content, in particular European content, which is good for Yes, you. I think, and I've read about it as well, and there is this new this new law in France, like the SMA, where okay. the, um, even if you're like a global player, if you want to be able to broadcast in Europe, you're gonna have to show, to broadcast a certain percentage of European content. Uh, it's not very new. Uh, it's not very new. It's been going on for a while. It's l'exception culturelle. Yeah, l'exception culturelle has been going on, but the the directive SMA is, is very recent. Has been recently confirmed. The fact ah, that uh, directive, so it's at the EU level for the twenty seven member states. It's not only France anymore. Yes, yes. Wow. The, the French one. The French one is even more specific, obviously, because we always have to be more specific. <laughs> um, <laughs> about it. Right, right, right. Uh, directive SMA. How interesting. Okay, so it's been basically taking that concept and then um, in implementing it in the 20 26 of the member states of the EU. <laughs> yeah, so you bet they do need a lot of European content, otherwise they, can't, they just can't play their services there. Yeah. Yeah. But that's good for that's good for what we call catalog films, like films that may have been. Um, may have come out like maybe a few years ago, maybe not 20 years ago, maybe four or five years ago and haven't sold everywhere. This is kind of their time now because uh, um, they're ready, they're oven ready and um, they're available to, to sell. And have you seen a slowdown in the, um, in the productions which have been made since, let's say, mid-2019? One of the, apparently, one of the other reasons for the shortage of content is because quite a lot of films have not been able to go in production because of COVID, because of the health and safety issues, because of insurance issues, the lack of financing, la di da di da So, <clears throat> yeah, professionals predict there will be yes. a big dearth of, of content. There's been like two slowdowns. There's been the slowdown of production um, because yeah, because we can't travel, we can't um, 
we can't do anything except staying home. Um, so obviously this has slowed down some production. Uh, I'm hearing that in France it's picking up a lot because now it has been, um, uh, the regulations are out as to or how many like people need to get a test every day before coming on a shoot and uh, being to wear a mask, the crew needs to wear a mask and so on. So okay. I'm hearing that there's a lot of like film and television uh, shootings going on in France now and I'm assuming elsewhere as well. Um, the other slowdown that happened last year was the films that were ready, like the author driven films that were ready that were not pushed into the festival circuits because the festivals were not um, physical. And for instance, all the films that I planned to premiere in Cannes in 2020, and they delayed because they wanted Cannes was cancelled. And and you want a red carpet, you want some press, you want to have some crazy directors. They just they just want a theatrical release at all costs. So, for example, the Wes Anderson film French Dispatch has been postponed to 2022. Yeah. Crazy like that. I mean, hello, lots of um, yeah, lots of film like from major studios have been postponed. I. I think this is such a, you know, a, a bad reflection on, on, on a lack of ad adaptation to what's happening at that moment. <laughs> it's very, like, it's very frustrating for the audience. I understand where they come from as directors because you really don't want to devaluate your film, and I think the fear of taking your film out at a moment where it's going to be, it's going to be anywhere a slow moment, like a a kind of a down moment for the market, what will it mean for your next film? You know, it's, we know that for a filmmaker, how he's going to make his next film depends on how his current film is going to be uh, welcomed on the market. So I'm not too worried for Wes Anderson in particular, but for other directors, I can understand that they, they, they need to push their titles for the best and biggest exposure because otherwise they're not going to raise as much money for the next film. That's how it goes. Yeah, but I, I think the paradigm has changed we have no idea when theaters are going to open again and frankly i think that you know 50 percent of regular film goers before pandemic are not going to return to cinemas anytime soon i went to see la daronne uh the french with um uh, with uh which was fun actually uh, sorry isn't it Isabelle Huppert? Oui, sure. Isabelle Huppert uh, in Paris, just, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, I think in November 2020, when films like theatres were uh, reopened again, I wasn't feeling comfortable because, you know, the people around me, they all just all want to be in the centre, for which is just surrounding me, uh, uh, the public, members of the public were surrounding me, the, the, the two metres distance wasn't respected. So I was wearing my mask during the whole uh, 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 screening which wasn't fun. And as I said, I wasn't feeling comfortable because I was surrounded by all these people who wanted to be at the same place because we all wanted to be in the center. So I, I don't think that lots of people are going to return to the cinema anytime soon, especially if they feel very vulnerable, etc. So I don't know, I think there's still quite a lot of catching up from the big, you know, the big names and the big studios. So um, in, do you have any perhaps examples of titles that you would like to share with us that um, Doug, Doug Wolf has, has dealt with and give us an example of what he, he it, it has been doing in relation to that particular title? Uh, sure. Well, I would have, um, I would have many, but let me, let me think of something recent maybe. I mean, there's a film that we have produced and, and financed and that we showed um, in Sundance in January this year. Mm -hmm. uh, that is about Valerie Taylor, who's um, who's been uh, diving. She's a woman. She's in her eighties now, in her seventies now, and okay. she's been diving with sharks since she was um, in her twenties. She spent her life diving with sharks, and she Where? was uh, which part of the world? In Australia. In Australia, she's Australian. White sharks. Are and, okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and she's <laughs> amazing with her husband. <laughs> she has like this fascinating footage, like underwater footage from the 70s and the 80s that she's been filming with her husband. And she initially she started as a shark, um, as a hunter, not a hunter, but like, a, yeah, I mean, I guess we call it shark hunter. Right. And she moved to become a conservationist and, and a, a champion for the environment and, and the protection of sharks. And she's still diving today. And so we have this beautiful, beautiful film about her. Um, with, of course, great access to her life and her personal archives that we've been screening at Sundance that got like amazing reviews. And on the back of this uh, Sundance screening was acquired by National Geographic Worldwide, um, oh. which was like obviously 
absolutely fantastic for the film and for for herself, for Valerie, and and to know that her story is gonna be told and shared at such a huge scale. That's that is the kind of great um, kind of adventure you go through because you bought a film. We bought this film two years ago, and you 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 have a team. You have to set up a team. We work with the producers in Australia. It's like it's quite long distance. It's not always very easy and stuff like this. And to have this kind of um, payoff of the film get going to such a big international streamer and global player with the, the prestige of the National Geographic brand, that was that was great. Great way to start the year. Well done. And so I suppose that so when you say streamer, it's at, as I, if I remember well, the National Geographic does have a, a, a TV channel, or maybe several actually. So it's initially it's a pay TV channel that wow. is broadcasted in many most of the Western countries, but okay. they're also part of the Disney Plus bundle. Oh. So it's Disney Plus now. Yeah. So it's going to be on Disney Plus. Oh, that's, that's really awesome. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Um, and so on that, yeah. So you, it was like you were involved at the whole stages of a supply chain. Yeah, that's great. Yes. Um, so uh, moving on slightly from uh, <laughs> away from the film industry for a second, you actually contacted me when I sent out an, 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 an email, I mean, after I sent out an email about cancel culture, which was one of the updates I sent, I think it was um, end of last year because it was becoming quite relevant in Europe. Of, of course, we're always one year uh, uh, um, late compared to the U US people, but... Um, <laughs> Do you want to do you want to expand on on the feedback that you you had about this uh, this particular piece? I, okay, just to give you some background though, I had the idea of um, drafting a piece about cancel culture, la culture de l'annulation, so cancellation. Uh, further to listening to an excellent excellent podcast from uh, Histoire d'Amérique, which is a French podcast about American stories, which had been um, uh, actually produced and um, edited by Aude Chalumeau. So she's uh, like a new kid on the block in the f French journalist scene. And so the, 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 the uh, background uh, material of this story about cancel culture was actually uh, the book released by the wonderful Brett Easton Ellis, which is white, where he was actually describing all these issues with cancel culture. So that's the background. So what, what, would you like to share with us your constructive feedback about this piece? I'm ready. You can go. No, I'm joking. That's fine. I'm cool. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was just a fantastic. This new newsletter first that you send is always like uh, such a resourceful uh, newsletter to read. It's like always very, very interesting. And thank you for that. And I thought this one in particular was really interesting because you were also going back to um, the history, in a sense, of cancel culture and how it yeah. comes from the 90s and what we would call like culture wars. And you were also like different approaches of what, what free speech uh, entails from a legal point of view in the US and in the UK and in France. And the reason is very, very, I think, insightful and enlightening right now because obviously this thing of cancel culture it feels at least that it's something that is coming from, from the other side of the Atlantic and it's coming it our way. Yeah. Uh, but it's not something that uh, was born in Europe or not under this form, at least. Correct. Obviously, it had, there's some precedent. Um, I think the one point where I wanted to, I wanted to discuss with you is this yep. question of like the consequence it has in our creative industries mm -hmm. in terms of um, what we would call, I think, diversity, which yeah. is the, the um, maybe the expectation that now we're going to be more, we as in the business people in the creative industry, we're going to be more looking at talents from a more diverse background and uh, maybe more women as well. Yeah. And whether that is cancelling in a way to some white male talents or mm. what what is kind of the spirit of this and if it, it can be damageful or not. Yeah. Um, I think that's obviously that's something we deal with every day as a, as a production company and as a distributor. Okay. Because we are here to provide content to distributors and distributors provide content to the audience and the right. audience are the reflection of the society and mm -hmm. and cancel culture is a big part of our society right now. Um, it's a question that something we debate quite a lot in my company and with also industry friends and so on. I think it's important to keep in mind that 
the creative industry as it is right now isn't really far from being a fair reflection of our society in terms of diversity. So there's there's still a long way to go. Mm-hmm. And maybe this long way to go needs a little push, but that's my personal opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, that may feel frustrating to some, uh, but I don't think you can really... I don't see how you could argue that this isn't in the sake of the greater good. Sure, I, I I agree with you. I think this. I mean, the reason why I I, I really delved into this subject, uh, in addition to listening to that wonderful podcast, um, Histoire d'Amérique on uh, on White, the book from uh, Brett Easton Ellis, it was actually a fascinating subject. And uh, um, it's true that with the Me Too, it gives also some 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 context to all these Me Too movements or Balance Ton Port in I think it's called, which is not very nice, but I mean, it's just not as elegant as Me Too or, or Black Lives Matters. But it gives some context as to what's going on here. Um, well, um, the, just just for 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 the sake of completeness, the, the point I made about with, uh, when I at the, at the bottom, like at the third part, uh, part, part party of this of this part of this um, article I wrote about cancel culture, where I actually illustrated the uh, uh, white male point of view, which is that they feel a bit left out because now it's going to be the gay person or the the, the female person or the Latino or the black or whatever who who is going to be um, uh, um, uh, prioritized as opposed to them, um, heterosexual white males. Um, if this is because it was actually a point re- uh, which was apparently um, uh, um, discussed at length in the book White, and, it, and it's, it's also mentioned in the in the podcast. So I thought it would be interesting to give you know the uh, the perspective from both angles. But I agree with you that in Europe, in particular, and I'm sure in other continents like Africa or Asia, we still a really long way to go uh, before the uh, patriarchy is <laughs> is down and uh, <laughs> and on its knees. There's still a lot of work to do. Having said that, though, you know, I, I mean, maybe because I'm a child of the um, of the 70s and the 80s and the UP at heart, so to speak. No, I'm joking. But maybe, I mean, for me, it's the best project that wins. This, it's the best, best, you know. I don't really care whether it's been done by a woman or a man or a, a person of color, green, you, you know, red or whatever. I don't care. I want the content to be engaging, you know, and um, and and to 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 touch me or to be of use to me as as as. So that man is. I think this um, when you were saying a push needs to be given, yes. But then at the end of the day, uh, it's who get gives the best content to the to the uh, to the masses to the public who is going to win. So I mean, am I wrong in thinking this or? Or, or because there are some parameters that I am not aware of. But for me, it's always been my point of view, you know. If you give some good content to your audience, we will really yeah. give a fuck about whether you're a woman or a man or gay or stray or whatever. I just want to have your great content. Ah, end of the story. Obviously. Obviously, and that's always kind of the, um, the conclusion when, I, when we discuss it whether, like, with industry people. It's like, obviously, at the end of the day, talent speaks more than than anything there's one thing that we need to keep in mind is that we know as the middle man and middle woman and as the kind of behind the scene business of the film industry and of the creative industries that for talent to at least have access to exposure there's so many steps before that and all those steps mm-hmm. are hit and, and, and stain in a way by unconscious bias. And this oh, is okay. where I think the push needs to be given. I see. We what. need to also question ourselves. As we want to, to a level playing field at the beginning, yes. especially. Yeah, okay, no, that's fair. And, and check in with ourselves if we are giving the same opportunities as far as our business reaches to, to um, white people as non-white people, to male talents as female talents. Mm-hmm. And maybe we're gonna have to look a little bit further to find more diversity but maybe that's also part of our role because maybe there are stories there that are just as good or even better and also they're going to be fresher and newer we just haven't been reaching out further enough to get them 
But actually, that segues very nicely into my last question for this uh, for this podcast, which is, what are the trends that you are seeing in you know in film distribution and consumption for the next five to ten years, especially now with COVID, which is just forcing the uh, film industry and the studios to um, to stop the uh, the sort of theatrical release, um, uh, you know. Um, uh, dictatorship, so to speak, and uh, and also, don't you think, since you were saying there needs to be more of a level playing field so that everybody can have access to, uh, you know, filmmaking? Don't you think that actually the fact that everybody not now, for example, for eighty nine euros can attend the EFM, um, everybody can now do, you know. Uh, what's it called again, uh, virtual production online. So it's probably cheaper than having, you have to have massive, massive sets and location. That levels the playing field because it's cheaper, right? It's getting cheaper and more, you just need a good MacBook Pro and, and you know, you, you could even film with your iPhones like um, Sean Baker did for his film Tangerine, you know, and that's how he, he, he rose to the, uh, so so what, what are the trends that you are seeing in terms of film distribution and, and also consumption? So the end consumers, perspective in the next five to ten years with the push from COVID? Yes, I mean, COVID definitely accelerated so, so much, so many things in, in the way we consume films and in the stores. You know what? Great! Well. I'm like, great! Because you guys were so behind compared to the music industry. I mean, hello! The, sh the shift that happened in the music industry like ten years ago and the films were like, oh no, theatrical release this, theatrical release that. I was like, fuck that! Everybody's is even parroting all the films on, on uh, Time for Popcorn. Ah, I think I lost you. Hello. Are you here? The music industry is still, it looks like the music industry is still. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just wanted to say the music industry, they mm. seem to be going through a bit of um, self-introspection uh, as well right now, no? because I'm, I'm reading a lot about how um, songwriters need, I mean, are asking for more recognition and more revenues as well coming from the streamers and so on. So it's not, uh, they haven't found their final destination yet. That's it's true. still a figuring out process, yeah. Would you agree that the push towards digital was forced by piracy oh, yeah. like 10 years ago, you know, the likes of Napster mm. and, um, uh, yeah, and Pirate Bay? Well, in the film industry, there was a, I think there was an enormous reluctance from many dinosaurs to move on, but now no longer with COVID. I just can't avoid it anymore. <laughs> oh, I don't see. You know what? I, I do believe, I do have faith in, like, um, the creativity of some distributors and exhibitors. And I'm really curious to see what ev everything is going to be different. Nothing will ever be the same. That's for sure. But okay. as far as I'm concerned, I can't tell how it's at, at far, as far as like distribution is concerned. I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% certain it's going to go this way or that way. I'm oh. really curious actually. But what, I, I do believe in the resilience of distribution. Sorry. I believe in the resilience of the distribution of business. Course, of mm -hmm. course. I mean, it, be it on streamers or in theatricals or whatever, we will still need some content. We will still need some distribution. But what is your yeah. feeling more specifically about what's going to happen now? For example, once COVID is, uh, it's never going to go away. I think every time, it, uh, every season when it's very cold, it's going to come back like the flu. But um, do you think that when it's possible to move about and go back to theatres, do you think that um, we're going to have, that, again, that question of, oh, oh we, we can't have day and date release again? Or do you think that this is going to be passé, so to speak? Oh, it really depends on the countries. I think in France, they're going to keep on like um, trying to protect the windows for a while and for longer than anywhere else. Uh, in the UK, it's already been, it's already been shortened. Uh, in the US, let's see if the HBO Max uh, uh, schedule for 2021 expands further than 2021, but it's looking like it's looking very likely. Uh, so this is all going to be reshuffled and it's as far as theatres are concerned, cinema theatres, I'm, I'm expecting it to become something very event-based and it's not going to be theatrical runs 
uh, you know, playing 1 p.m. five times a day is going to be about having a meal at the same time or mm-hmm. having a show, a live show before or after or, or winning a ticket is going to be more, more bespoke okay. um, for people to, to consume uh, films in theatres, at least in the UK, I think, mm-hmm. probably in the US as well. And in terms there's a thing which does that quite well in the, in the UK, if I may interject here. It's, I think, the, um, the, elec- uh, the, uh, uh, the electric. Electric, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think, I think gonna, this is, because I think it's also the only way for them to actually make money, because mm-hmm. just making money for a cinema just out of selling tickets is not enough. So they need to build up more of an event, something more like uh, exciting, more mm-hmm. exciting, I feel bad saying this, but like more. A special, more of a one-off feeling um, around the film itself, which again is super exciting as well. It's very there's a lot of creative things to be done I around. Agree, but even in VCFM, there's so much creativity going on. Even the way you know the age, age, age um, events at a state, or possibilities to replay. I think that's really great. Uh, for me, for VEFM, there are still too many events which are closed, um, where like you have to have an invitation and stuff like that. And I think in this era, you know, the equipment, right. yeah, I don't think that's fair. Yeah, everybody, <laughs> because you can't say there's not enough room, you know, in the in the in the, there's not enough places in the room. You can't say that anymore, right? It's because obviously there's no yeah, room. Exactly. So, yeah, there's no limit to whoever can attend. So as long as you are an attendee and a participant in VEFM, you should be able to attend all sessions. But Still, I, f- I found that some some of them were a bit too um, um, secretive for me uh, because I couldn't attend them. But um, yeah, that's uh, okay. So basically, you are staying very very positive. You think creativity is definitely going to win and resilience um, on the distribution side. What about the consumption and consumers? What what I, what trends do you see in terms of taste? In terms of how they want to consume? I think I might have lost you again. Ah, hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yes. I, I can't see you, oh. but I can hear you. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep the camera off for now, um, just okay. to save a bit of bandwidth. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, consumption, you mean for the, the content or the way films are going to be consumed? Uh, both. Both. It's uh, it's a big question mark, but it does look like uh, we are we are really taking the digital turn of even faster uh, than expected. Good. And and there's some great in there as well. When you see what Apple is doing, um, not Apple, sorry, Disney Plus is doing, and Netflix have been in the pandemics, uh, all these special features where you can stream them at home at the same time as your friends, so it feels like you're watching together and you can cool. send text around them. This is a way to recreate um, some 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 feeling of being social around watching a film. Um, and in terms Netflix of... Content, again? Sorry, who does this? Netflix and I think uh, Disney Plus as well have this wow. feature. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And yeah, content... I'm, I'm really hoping and I'm starting to see a bit in the, the projects I see in development and, and coming up in production, some some reflection of this diversity topic that we covered already and this question of mm-hmm. having more more diverse voices. Um, I feel there is a big need of, not, not a need, but a thirst from the audiences to hear more diverse experiences okay. and to have something that changes a bit from the usual um the usual storyline that we know about a broken man that's gonna achieve great things and women are in the background and we've heard this story 25 times and which is also a way to question the whole question of genres in films Mm -hmm. uh, which has been uh, maybe a little bit uh, tried in the in the last maybe 10 years and i think it's really good if we can walk away from the strict genres of the action film and the romantic comedy the 90 minutes feature i think the formats as well are, are being revisited and i think it's going to be very very exciting actually okay well that's that sounds really awesome that sounds awesome and i'm glad that you have such a positive outlook on the future um and um yeah i feel excited about that lucy i know you have um you are tied up in another meeting at five so um thank you ever so much i'll be back in touch with you soon once i've edited this okay and uh thank you again thank you thank you so much for taking the time have a good weekend Yes, likewise. Bye, have a good weekend. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Lawfully Creative, produced by Crefervy Studios.
Subscribe to our podcast or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, YouTube, Anchor, and many more podcast aggregators and platforms. Please leave a review and rating about our podcast to encourage others to discover our curated content. Thank you.